Good evening. My name is Johanna Koljonen and you are watching Cross Talks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Please join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. Humans have always looked to the sky trying to understand our place in the universe and now we are living in a time where we soon might be able to explain some of the really big mysteries. We are on the brink of being able to properly describe some of the big issues in particle astrophysics like dark matter and the earliest stages of the birth of the universe. At the same time, we are seeing a renewed interest in space technology from both the private and public sectors. How will the technology and theori theoretical frameworks emerging today affect our exploration of the cosmos? How does hands-on research into spaceflight interact with theoretical physics? And what are the next milestones in understanding the universe and our place in it? Here to discuss these fascinating topics are Christer Fuglesang, ESA astronaut, adjunct professor in space physics and director of KTH Space Center at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Catherine Fries, theoretical astrophysicist, professor of physics at Stockholm University and director of Nordita, the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics. And finally, Ariel Gubar, a professor of experimental particle astrophysics at Stockholm University and director of the Oscar Klein Center for Cosmoparticle Physics. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine, starting early in your career, you have done a lot of exciting work in the study of dark matter, which we know must make up a large portion of the total mass of the universe, even though we can't exactly find it. You believe that we will soon be able to see dark matter in experiments and gain a better uh, understanding of what it might be. Mm -hmm. How close are we to this breakthrough? Well, let me put this in context first. Mm -hmm. So this question, what is the universe made of, has a surprising uh, information. So all the things that we're used to, your body, the chairs, the air, the planets, the stars, all of that is made of atoms, but all of that added together only constitutes 5% of the universe. So we have to understand the rest. So our galaxy in particular is comprised almost entirely of something that's not giving off light, so we call it dark. And this dark matter, we believe it's made of some new kind of fundamental particle. There would be billions going through you every second, but they don't have strong interactions or electromagnetic interactions, but they may have weak interactions, the kinds of things that are responsible for some types of radioactivity. And based on that, we can look for these particles. So there's three approaches. One is that you would collide protons together at almost the speed of light at, at CERN, mm -hmm. the particle accelerator in Geneva, and you would create these particles. Nothing yet, but it's just turned on again and we shall see. Mm -hmm. Or you have deep underground detectors that are sitting there waiting for these particles in the galaxy to hit. And that's, these are very difficult signals to detect, but some experiments are seeing anomalous results and we're hoping that maybe, maybe something's there. And you know, there are other approaches, but the, the basic story is that we do have anomalous results and it maybe we've already detected the dark matter, but we're not sure. But we do think that within the next decade, this problem should be solved. That's very exciting. Yeah, exciting times. So if, if we are able to understand better what dark matter is and, and how it behaves, I, I guess it could be many things Yeah. Uh, as well. What would that mean for our understanding of the universe? I would say that since antiquity, people have been trying to figure out to understand their surroundings. And this is what makes us successful as a species, is that we push always into some frontier and so if we understand this, I, I actually have a, a book for the public called The Cosmic Cocktail, and this is, the universe is a cocktail of pieces. And understanding these different pieces just a, on a very fundamental nature is, I think, of deep importance to humanity. Mm. Ariel Gubar, uh, you're also dabbling in the dark arts. Uh, you're, uh, you were part of the research team that uh, discovered the force, now ref we refer to as dark energy. Uh, which is believed to be driving the expansion of the universe. And uh, this work actually led to your team leader sharing the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011. So even a layperson understands this is a big deal. Could you explain what dark energy is and how it was discovered? Right. So, so let me start going back to the 1930s, where astronomers discovered that the universe expands. 
That means that galaxies are receding from each other. In fact, every distant point is receding from another one. So space is growing. And much later, in the 1990s, we decided to figure out how much that expansion is slowing down due to the effect of gravity. Just as Katie mentioned, we, you know, there's a lot of dark matter out there, and we decided to measure how much there is. And the experiment, essentially, was pretty similar to if I were to throw up my keys in the air, they would sort of slow down to the effect of gravity, and eventually will come to stop and fall down again. We thought pretty much the same would happen with the velocities of galaxies, that because of the mutual attraction from gravity, that it would actually be slowing down. So we expected the expansion of the universe to slow down due to the effect of gravity. Now, of course, we didn't find that. Uh, we found the opposite. It didn't slow down at all. Uh, but, you know, to our huge surprise, we found that for the last 7 billion years or so, the expansion has been speeding up. And, uh, you know, uh, that was very unexpected. So, you know, the universe, or a large fraction of the universe, a large fraction of this cocktail that Katie is talking about, like 70% of the universe is made up of something that does not at all behave as what we expected. And, you know, this is, you know, some witty scientists at Chicago call that dark energy, I guess maybe to mock us, I don't know. But that name <laughs> did catch on. So this dark energy is what is 70% of the universe, which we, un I should emphasize, understand, understand very, very poorly, which is actually doing the opposite. It's like my keys, instead of falling down, they will just continue on and fly faster and faster. So that's, in short, you know how we discovered it. We discovered that the universe acceleration, uh, expansion is, is, is speeding up. And, and what it is, is, is more unclear. But just to be entirely clear, dark energy and dark matter are not related, and they are not sort of the reverse of matter and energy, so, as we know them. You know, are this, are this, it sounds like a joke, but it's true. Dark matter is attractive. Dark energy is repulsive. Don't so look at me. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't, wasn't meant that way. No, but it's true. And so some they're... they're women, women, uh, Wait, what? Some other men and some other women. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> So, no, the, the, so, so it's, it's actually is a misnomer in terms. It, they are very different things. At least at, at this moment, we do not know if there's any relation between dark matter and dark energy. That's one of the you know, frontiers in the field to understand if there might be. So we have to, we have to keep in mind that these are metaphoric labels yes. at, at this point. Very good. Mm -hmm. Christoph Fuglsang, you come uh, to this from a, 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 an entirely different perspective. Uh, much you more are down to yours. Mm. Sorry? I'm much more down to the earth. M much closer to the earth, at least, <laughs> given that, that you've made two trips to the uh, International Space Station. You also have a PhD in particle physics, and you've worked, for instance, uh, at CERN, of course, where the accelerator is now. Uh, how did your academic interests uh, play into your decision to also pursue a career as an astronaut? Well, uh, there are many things you can do in space. And uh, most, I guess, I was excited in getting a chance to go to space. But we do a lot of various research out there, and, uh, and part of the research is to understand the universe. And we study particles also from space. So all these things played in, into the big picture when I wanted to become an astronaut. But um, truly, uh, you do, as an astronaut, do much uh, less research than you do as a scientist in a lab or in, in a university. So I had to give up some of my research to go to the space, but I mean, that was a kind of sacrifice I was prepared to do. Did these trips into space change your views on how we should go about understanding the universe? No, I wouldn't say that my trips changed how we should go about. I mean, we, we need to do all these ways. As was just explained, you have the laboratory, you have controlled experiments like in CERN, we have just open searches and we do them underground where we are shielded from other things. And we also do them in, in space, where we just observe what comes to us. And also there we have experiments looking for signatures of dark matter. We don't see them directly, but indirect effects of them. So actually the biggest experiment on the International Space Station is such an experiment. And of course we put this beautiful, huge, uh, telescopes up there, like the Hubble Space Telescope, and also observation from that telescope, which helped us uh, find this dark energy, which is the experiment which uh, Ariel just talked about. Yeah, I did. Th uh, there are three prongs that we have in the approach to dark matter detection. The one I was waiting for mm -hmm. to dis discuss was also this one, which we call indirect detection, where you have dark matter particles annihilating, and then you look for 
what comes out of that annihilation, and one place to look for that is with this detector on top of the uh, International Space Station. And I was excited that astronauts came to KTH last week, and I got to meet one of the guys who put <laughs> up this particular detector. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> And the other place they do this kind of science, one of the best in the world, is at the Oscar Klein Center. So I'll let you, uh, Ariel, talk. Uh, <laughs> so, of course, uh, you know, a big chunk of our viewers are grad students who are, who are mm -hmm. looking to find their way in this field. So what I hear you say is that coming to Stockholm is not a bad, it's not a bad choice. You're uh, idea. Well, that's why, that's why I'm here. It's one of the best places in the mm -hmm. world to do dark matter and dark energy science. I, I have to ask you ab about another uh, of your research fields, inflation theory. And now we're at the limits of what I'm understanding, of course. But it's trying to explain the very first moments of the birth of the universe, where the universe is uh, expanding exponentially fast. Mm -hmm. And you have a theoretical model, perhaps, of, of this inflation. Could you explain it a little bit? Yeah, so the, the uh, question of the standard model of cosmology, which is this hot Big Bang picture. The universe started out very hot, very dense. It's been cooling and expanding, and we know that's true. But it doesn't explain why the universe on large scales is so smooth. So we need this early expansionary period called inflation to smooth it out. Mm. And in the kinds of models that I write down and, is, and, and others, it's, you can think of it like a ball rolling down a hill. And the shape of that hill determines it makes predictions for observations. So you can actually test specific models as to what, uh, as exactly how the ball rolled down the hill. Um, and so we're hoping to determine which of these models is right. So you see, we're hoping to determine, will, is this testable at all? In f the basic idea of inflation has already been tested and it's coming out correct, but Mm, to really prove it's right, you're going to have to. There, there's a lot of there's experiments trying to do this, and what they use is the early light left over from the Big Bang. It's called the cosmic microwave background light, and so inflation makes specific predictions for what that light should look like, and some of those are already true. And so it's it's really s staggering how how well things are tested, but the details will take time. I. I would like to ask all of you, what impact do you think it would have if, if we could explain the birth of the universe in a, in a satisfying way? Well, you know, if I could start, I, I, I think it would be awesome in so many ways. You know, I, first of all, you know, if, as a, you know, philosophically speaking, as a human being, just, just a picture that we as human beings sitting on in a, in a little you know, solar system, in a stellar system, in a little, in a just you know, average galaxy, a galaxy uh, can figure out how the entire universe began. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's mind-boggling, right, that we can actually... It, it gives you some hope that what, it, what humans can do if actually if, if, we, if we put our mind to that. But then, you know, I, but it doesn't stop there. As, as, as a physicist, of course, just the, the concept that we can understand, put together the, the biggest, you know, the biggest things in the universe, the biggest scales, and boil it down to the smallest scale. So, so really the micro and the, uh, and the macro cosmos, and we can put it all together with one set of, you know, one model, one, one, one set, of, you know, set of laws of nature that we have, that would be truly spectacular. I mean, that, that, that uh, to me as a scientist, I, I cannot think of any bigger achievement, actually. You look so joyful. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I think if somebody wasn't already excited about this, they must be now. Catherine. <laughs> uh, I would agree with everything that you just said that uh, these are big questions about the universe and we're, it's the, the amount that we've achieved in the last hundred years as human beings understand, uh, understanding is just enormous. So even at the time of Albert Einstein's theoretical advances in relativity, which was in 1915, scientists still didn't know that there is anything beyond our Milky Way galaxy. So when they looked out at the bright objects, they thought, well, this is all, these are stars within our galaxy. And then it, it was at some point in the 1920s, I guess, when it became clear that, no, 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 these things are really far away and that we're seeing galaxies that are way out there. And then the, on the observational side that the universe is expanding, that was all new and it's all less than 100 years old. And now we think we understand basically everything all the way out to the edge of the observable universe, defined by how much time it takes light to get... It, it, light 
travels at the speed of light. Information <laughs> can't go faster than the speed of light, and so yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a limit to how far out we can see, and we understand basically everything out to that distance. That's just phenomenal. Chris? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, um, it's absolutely amazing that um, basically just using observations we can do today of nature, some controlled experiment, and our brains, we are able to figure out the whole history of, of uh, the universe down to something like 10 to the minus 37 seconds or where, where you are. And I'm sure we will be able to maybe figure out even more on back. But uh, there will always, I really, be a question of what before that? Or why did it kick off? I mean, some of the things that, well, the universe is forever and maybe some cycling thing, although now in the days maybe it more looked like it was one startup. But there are certain theories that we have a, what we call multiverse that we are just one out of an infinite number of universe, universal, or there will be plural. But uh, one question I think is more coming almost to the philosophical thing. Why is anything at all? Why mm -hmm. did anything start at all? And that, you know, there will always be a limit where you will always be able to ask one question further. We're not going from to run out yeah. of and, 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 uh, yeah. But <laughs> that's our curiosity. Once we answer this question, well, we can answer what's before that and what's before that. Joining us now via Skype is Kim Stanley Robinson, revered American writer of literary hard science fiction, best known, of course, for his Mars trilogy. Welcome to Crosstalks. No, thanks. It's good to be here. I, I do have to ask first uh, uh, whether astrophysics mm. knowledge um, plays into your, to your everyday work at all. Usually it doesn't because I'm writing about people um, confronting direct problems of engineering and politics. But I, I'm interested, like anyone, and uh, my characters are often scientists doing similar work. I want to thank the speakers for their clarity. Um, I usually don't comprehend as well as I have the speakers today. <laughs> and I, I bet that's a common view. Um, I, I think the names are strange, and this is what I can add to the discussion. The dark matter strikes me as invisible matter. Uh, dark energy strikes me as, as inexplicable expansion. And the Big Bang was a name given to the phenomenon by an opponent. And so it was a kind of joke. And so what I think these names do for the, for the general public, an idea isn't quite right. The metaphors. So that's um, something to think about and something that I think physicists have to deal with when they're trying to explain these uh, problems and concepts. They have to use the normal names, but, but the normal names are deceptive. Yeah, we, we have yeah. To, we're, we're going to try and, and reconnect um, Kim Stanley Robinson. We have a, a slightly poor line, but let's reflect on, on this now. What, what does it mean to you that these names are off, so to speak? Big Bang also is a name that started out as a joke. These are metaphors. In some sense, there is liter literature is happening also on the side of science. Uh, is that a bad thing? Is that a dangerous thing? I think it shows that uh, scientists are kind of people like to joke around. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, these are the other ones, the quarks, the name of the basic uh, constituents of the atoms, uh, basically. I mean, also kind of just a fun name someone came up with. Yeah, it's from a book by James Joyce. Yeah, picked up by a scientist <laughs> yeah. when he needed to name these new particles. He actually hypothesized. He hadn't found them. He just thought he could explain better the, uh, the phenomenon we have by proposing, uh, postulating these particles. And later we found them. So surprisingly, scientists have a sense of humor. It's <laughs> sometimes very odd, but you know, I think that that's what, what we hear here. The names are funny things that maybe were funny at the time, and, and then take, taken out of context, they, they really sound weird now, but that's uh, the way it is. Oh, now I have to say about the dark matter candidates. Okay, so there were the machos, <laughs> <laughs> massive, compact, halo objects. But they have lost out to the wimps, <laughs> the weekly interacting massive particles. I was reading about reading up about <clears throat> on, on this, and I don't. Who gets to decide that they're called machos and wimps? Because somebody did that on purpose, surely. Initiative. Well, people you take the initiative, you get the power. <laughs> 
Well, if, if you come yeah. up with a funny name... It sticks. It sticks until someone yeah. come up, comes up with a better name. And, you know, if names are really good, then, you know, you kind of beat them. So those are the ones that People stick. People start using it because <clears throat> yeah. they like it. There, but there's, again, there's storytelling uh, happening as well. I think everybody mm. was rooting for the wimps over the machos. So, so it's lucky that science... <laughs> I mean, the wimps have won, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. good. <laughs> good. <laughs> so, but, but, I mean, is it... Is it do you think of of what you do as, in some sense, invention, of of creating something out of nothing and, and, and nothing and giving it names and then going out to see whether you happen to be right? Create writing in that sense. Well, I'm I'm more of an experimentalist and observer, so I, I think the creation part maybe I, I pass it on to Katie, who's the theorist. I mean, you create things, I I, I just start to find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. So we we invent stuff and. <laughs> If we're lucky, it matches nature. And if we're unlucky, then we've done science fiction. But it's not science fiction that endures because it just was wrong. So the idea can be great. The math can be proper. The calculations, know, everything can be great. But it has to match nature. So and then we sometimes, need you. Yeah, and sometimes we, we find you. the opposite. Like in this case with dark energy, it was, it was great that actually we as experimentalists, we set out you know, to do an experiment to measure the complete opposite. So in fact, you know, the hardest people to convince were ourselves, right? Because we could not believe our results. And, if, and one of the beauties of, of cosmology, the topic we're talking about, about now, is that there are so many independent techniques. So we don't have to rely on one set of measurements, like Katie was saying for dark matter, the same is true for dark energy, is that you know, there are so many in the independent paths. And we only trust the answer when the various paths, which come from completely different ways of, of, of you know, measuring techniques, when they all converge to the same answer, that's only, only then that we actually think that we are onto something. That's something we and, can trust. And who would have guessed that we get to put this, that we, we get, as theorists get to work with data coming from space? Christian. Yeah. Well, I want to add also that in addition to the observations coming and agree, I, it's also we, we tend to believe it more when they all fit in a theory which kind of seems reasonable and which explains a lot of things. I mean, you have a great theory now, uh, you know, kind of a standard model of the universe and a standard model of the microcosmos, which both fits and explains many uh, various aspects of all the observations. As, as long as things fit into that, we observe them fit trustworthy, that we trust it. Something that would really contradict this high, these models, then it will take a long time to convince uh, ourselves or, uh, that this could be correct observation. So it's a little bit like the idea of mathematical elegance or the idea of an elegant equation. That, that this idea of the satisfying narrative somehow, the pieces do need to fit for, for the whole to make sense. So there's a sort of aesthetic aspect almost to this work. Oh, it, it is certainly some aesthetics also, yes. And logical, I would say. Mm. It has to be make logical sense. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think we may have Kim Stanley Robinson back. Uh, what an exciting uh, conversation <laughs> this observation kicked off. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to ask uh, a little bit, because we're moving into now to talk about, uh, about the relationship between astrophysics and the practical, technical uh, research and, and, and space travel and the role uh, of that. So I'd like first, Kim, for you to say, uh, what does your process for doing research and coming up with story ideas look like? Because it does seem entirely convincing when we read your novels. It's almost as though you have been to space uh, and traveled on these spaceships that haven't even been, been built yet. Well, thanks for that. A lot of it comes down to reading books and now reading the Internet. And what that does is give me my original ideas. After that, I go on to um, trying to... Uh, imagine it, and then on a need-to-know basis, I research further, and uh, some of that involves calling up scientists on the phone or meeting with them down at NASA Ames in the Bay Area and asking them questions. This has uh, been a very uh, fun part of my work because I get to talk with people and I get to understand how scientists think and how astronomers also and, uh, and astronauts think about their work. 
So all of this comes together on a kind of need-to-know basis. First I decide what the story is about, and then I research it to try to make it seem as solid as possible. A lot of it comes down to rhetorical tricks of putting everything that I know on the page and then suggesting that's only 5% of what I know. <laughs> and that, that is a, a matter of uh, being an English major and working on stylistic problems. I'm, I'm happy to, re to report that the... Each Sorry. Yeah, I can do the style of a scientist. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that now yeah. I can uh, imitate is how scientists talk and how they write. I'm happy to report that the grad students laughed at this idea of writing down your 5% and, and trying to sound convincing. Um, I Obviously, Kim, you write in a very detailed and nuanced way about human relationships and human societies. So what does the presence of these sort of vast scale concepts and distances of like space uh, uh, and, and time, uh, what does it bring to these stories about the human experience for you? Well, I uh, responded very strongly to what one of your speakers on stage said about how if we can understand the entire universe, then it suggests that the human brain is uh, strong enough and in, in, in an uh, intimate enough relationship to the universe that we could also solve our own uh, ecological and political problems. So it's encouraging and it's also beautiful uh, to understand the universe as well as we are able. And also the fundamental mysteries, as the speaker said, will still remain. Why was there a Big Bang? What happened before it? Are there other universes? These are uh, unanswerable questions, although we can kind of poke away at them using the methods that the astrophysicists and, and the subatomic physicists are already using. So there's a kind of beauty involved and there are discrepancies and I also hear in the physicist's voices the pleasure of getting back to experimentation because there was a period where physicists were concerned with string theory and string theory is not amenable to experiments like at CERN because they were trying to talk about fundamental elements of, of the uh, construction of the universe that were too small for us to even experiment with. Now, with dark matter and dark energy, there are uh, workable experiments that can be thought about. And, and there is also the standing problem of the relationship between quantum mechanics and gravity, mm. which uh, mm. they don't match very well. And indeed, quantum mechanics, if that can actually help us to make computers, then that gets drawn right into the whole human enterprise in our chief technology, you might say. So uh, physics is now uh, applied again in a way that I think is bringing the joy to your physicists' faces. This brings us back beautifully <laughs> to, uh, to this, well, essentially, uh, uh, to what you are representing here today. Catherine and Ariel's research deals with phenomena eons away from the sort of near space. Or, or of course, it's universal. That means it's everywhere also here. But, but certainly the, the scales of things that we're talking about are very different from the, uh, the uh, near space uh, where humans are operating uh, currently. Uh, what impact does our ability to send people people and machines into space have on our understanding of these really big issues? Kristen? Well, one is very practical. Yeah, we can put experiments up there in space where you may need help people, humans, to, to help run them. Uh, maybe even most well-known is the Hubble Space Telescope, where we sent astronauts several times to service it, and it was wrongly designed when it came up there to start with, and we could send astronauts there to fix it. But in a more philosophical... Amazing, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. What, it, what it has accomplished, thank God. You're, oh, yeah, you're fix that's it. right. And, <laughs> but a little bit more, uh, maybe, philosophically, is that uh, just being able to send people to space, it kind of gives people the feeling, everyone goes, wow, we can do that. We can reach out. Well, this is the first step. And we've been to the moon. There are further steps. You can go to the Mars, finding or establishing that we have floating waters Mars, which was recently reported. That certainly will you know, attract us going there further. And there's another huge question, of course, in, in our, what you want to understand, life. How did it start? Where can it appear? Well, this gives a good chance that there may be, or even to now, some life on Mars. So just being able to send people to space can also increase all our let's say, uh, attractiveness of space and we think more about space. Are there any breakthroughs in, in observations from space that you find particularly exciting? Catherine, of course, already mentioned one. Water on Mars, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Exoplanets? 
I mean, now <laughs> almost every day, or at least once a week, we, we yeah. find other planets around other stars. Yeah. We call them exoplanets. And the better observations we get, the smaller we can find. And we start to find those are more and more like our Earth. And my prediction is that in 15 years, we have established that there are life on some of them due to observation through chemical signatures. Catherine, I think maybe you can tell us about what dark stars are or might be and how the James Webb telescope might help us with finding out about that. Yeah. So uh, dark stars are an idea that I had with uh, somebody who Doug Spoliar at the time was a student. He's now a postdoc, actually, in the Oscar Klein Center in Stockholm University. And so together with a, with a third collaborator, we realized that dark matter could actually power stars. So that's not today's stars. These would be the very first stars that formed when the universe was 200 million years old. And you would have a coll collapsing cloud of hydrogen gas, but there's a lot of dark matter around. And the dark matter particles, if they're wimps, they annihilate among themselves, and that gives you a heat source that can power the star. And at first we thought, well, this is just a collapsing cloud of stuff with a, with a heat source, but eventually we realized, well, it took a year to realize they're actual stars. They are bright. They shine. And it took even longer to realize, well, and they can grow to become very big, a million times as massive as the sun, a billion times as bright, which means that the next generation of not the Hubble Space Telescope, but the James Webb Space Telescope, would be able to see the brightest of these. And so the, this, this James Webb Space Telescope, it's a NASA mission that will go up in 2018. And uh, we have a lot of hopes for discovering not just the things we're predicting, but also the unknown. Now, the thing that scares me a little bit is this time you can't send astronauts up to fix it. <laughs> so it better work the first time. <laughs> because I, I don't know it very well, because it's too far? No, it's more that it's not designed to be serviced by an uh, astronaut. Well, by the way, what's the orbit? It's, L2. it's at L2. Yeah. L2, yeah. That means it's far away. But we're also <laughs> building big rockets and uh, new spacecraft, which <coughs> would be able to go to L2. Okay. L2 is on Lagrangian point two, which is one of the points. That's the one on the backside of the moon, right? Uh, so where you can have a stable position in space, uh, and it's then uh, well shielded for all the disturbance from the Earth. That's why you put it there. I'm very happy to report that I read enough of science fiction to follow what, you, what this conversation <laughs> that, that just occurred. Of course we have to go there. We have to be able to go there if we need to go to Mars uh, as well. I, I think, it, yeah, I would like to ask, are there any other sort of, are there any specific breakthroughs in these technologies, apart from this telescope, obviously, that, that are particularly exciting to you, or space-related technologies? Um, in general, uh, Ariel, let's start with Well, you. I think what it's sort of, if I'm allowed to wish here, I think the most spectacular thing that is, is in the pipeline is uh, the uh, detection of gravitational waves, long, you know, uh, low-frequency uh, gravitational waves that, that would demand formation flight uh, in space. So you would have to have satellites, not only one satellite, like, say, the Hubble Space Telescope, but three of them at huge distances and all you have to know exactly what they are at each time because you're measuring how much these things move away from each other due to the ripples of space-time. Now, that, that, if that when, you know, that, hopefully that will happen before, you know, while I'm alive, uh, I think that would be the one most spectacular space uh, enterprise that, that, that I can picture at least. And, and one which would have the most, you know, amazing results, I, I'm sure. Well, well, while we're on the subject of gravity waves, inflationary models, inflation should also produce gravity waves. And they're, they're not the ones that he's talking about. What you're, you're talking about merging of, new, of very heavy objects, black holes or neutron stars or something, but I'm talking about the ones from, from inflation. And there, is, there are going to be balloon experiments at the South Pole, and um, in fact, again, Oscar Klein Center has an involvement in, 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 uh, in SPIDER, which is one of these balloons. But if you really want to do that job properly, you also have to go into space. And so that would be my dream to do that. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, what, are, uh, what leaps in space technology are we looking at that you're excited about right now? Oh, I'm just following the work of the scientists. So I myself am not, have no particular desires 
in that regard. And again, it's more engineering and um, politics. I would like to have a human presence on Mars and then all of the rest of the bodies in the solar system have scientific stations like in Antarctica. Um, the, I have been working recently on the issue of going to the stars because I want to suggest that we can't do it, that there is a, a fundamental difference and that at a certain point quantitative differences become qualitative differences. And so I'm a huge advocate of space science uh, and go, humans going to all the bodies of the solar system because these are our neighborhood and they teach us about Earth. Going to the stars as a human project is an old idea that I now think is a wrong idea. They're simply too far away, and because of our biological nature, we can't trap ourselves in a tiny compartments and survive long enough to get to the stars. And if we were to get to the stars, the planets we would encounter there would be uh, either alive or dead, and either way would present a terrible problem for human inhabitation. So there's a distinction to be made that I think the scientific community could be part of, and science fiction has been bad at, which is to suggest that the solar system is our home and our neighborhood, but that the stars are always going to be looked at by telescopes. I think uh, we need to bring in Christopher Fuglesang on this. Uh, well, I, I don't... I agree that we should go and uh, try to put up stations on as many bodies in the solar system as possible, and I'm sure that will happen. But I also think that we eventually will go to other stars. Uh, and uh, with a combination of faster spaceships and more like kind of space cities, mm -hmm. uh, which means that, okay, it will maybe take a couple of generations to go there. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the life on Earth, I've been here for about three and a half billion years. Uh, we have had uh, our species for uh, about 200,000 years, but primates for many billion, a million years. Uh, those time, uh, considering those times, I mean, the, that we may be in uh, 10,000 years from now would we'll be able to send a spaceship to another star. That's short. 10,000 years is very short in, in comparison to the, mm. the, the age of our planet and the age of life on our planet. Uh, but when do you, I mean? Do you agree that 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 we should go to Mars? Will that happen in our lifetime? Do you think? Uh, I think so. At least in your lifetime. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I must admit, for 25 years now, I said that we will be there in 25 years. But sometimes you have to be correct. And there are developments going on technologically wise, and and more than that, also that it's not only uh, we're talking about space agencies who has to do it. You have Elon Musk with his private company, SpaceX. He's built a rocket because he thinks NASA is doing too slow going to Mars. And he's been very successful. He has the most best hours, the cheapest way to send things to space today. And he's continuing working on that. So we will go to Mars. But I think we'll go to back to the moon first because we need to practice there. Mm. And then there's a lot of science to be done there as well. And I hope we'll be back on the moon within 10 years. The KTH Space Center was set up in part to encourage interdisciplinary work in, in space-related uh, research. Of course, it's relatively new, but, but do, you, do you think it's been successful? And also, is, is in, why is interdisciplinary work so important? Well, like cross-fertilization cross between areas leads to new ideas. And you know, new ideas coming from one field can then help us doing better things in space. You, you, you doing, using the, uh, the knowledge and the technology we use for space can be applied in other places. Uh, so, so that's why this cross-fertilization always is uh, valuable. And I think we've been successful. We've just been in uh, operation for a year and a half. And I mean, we started a student satellite project, which is also you know, to, to inspire young people. And we just had a big conference, I can't mention it, with 100, uh, almost 100 astronauts here, which really was about inspirational things. Not only that we astronauts exchange our uh, knowledge and learn more from what's going on, but we used all these astronauts to tell what they're doing, inspire, we went out to a lot of schools. So that's been our two most successful uh, events so far. I, I think we uh, have 
established uh, that that across sciences, uh, across disciplines, um, that, that's the weird, that everybody is helping each other. And you were talking, Ariel, about how all of these different ways of measuring, which of course all require different technologies, uh, are, are helping pinpoint some things that, that have, may have all only existed in theory. But interdisciplinary work is difficult and expensive, and it takes a long time to set up because people do need to, to be able to speak to each other as well. Do you feel that that your field of research and this direction uh, is getting the kind of funding and, and support that it deserves in the world. <laughs> I don't think you'll find one scientist said that he gets all the money he deserves. <laughs> 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 well, uh, um, my field started 25 years ago. It didn't exist before that. This, what Ariel was talking about of particle astrophysics, where the smallest particles are explaining the properties of the universe as a whole. So this was a, this was in between fields as far as funding and so on. Well, it's taking over. <laughs> so cosmology in general is a huge part of astronomy now. So in, this, is, this has been a success story for interdisciplinary work. Ariel. Indeed, and actually, and, and, and what maybe uh, makes this, leads to success, actually, in talking about, you know, there are many engineers here, engineer students, students is that you know, technology has been a huge boost for us. I mean, just to, mm. like my own experience, I was telling earlier on that you know, it was, there was some measurement in the 1930s that showed the universe expands, and I, I didn't tell you why it took so long until the you know, 1990s before we could actually measure the, that ex universe accelerating. Well, there were three things that helped. Internet, you know, uh, Fast, uh, so internet, uh, e digital imaging, and computers. Uh, and so we are obviously in, in you know, scientists and, and the, uh, you know, the general world, we, we need to collaborate in order, you know, we can only make great discoveries when technology allows us, allows us to do that. And, and in my particular case, you know, we could not have done these experiments uh, more than 20 years ago, just because technology wasn't, wasn't ready for that. And that's why, so now these technologies we're talking about now, it, sort of is, it, is, it is escalating. It's also so exciting, I think, if you're a young researcher, because it means that there's so much work. Uh, everybody can, can contribute to breakthroughs, right? I think I would like to open uh, for questions, if we have any questions uh, from the room. Is anyone feeling particularly brave? Not immediately? No? Um, so, in that case, I have a big one. Yeah. Ariel and Catherine, uh, I know that... A lot of what you do is basic research. Uh, that is often, uh, funding for it is often motivated with, well, it will come out practically useful down the line. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, that's of course true, but, but can you already see some ways in which what you're working on today might be practically useful? Well, so, uh, you know, if I, you know, it, it's, it's not actually, is again, it, it's, it's going back to the technology. Mm. I don't think that, exactly what the nature of dark energy is would actually have any implications that I can foresee. They might have, but I can foresee them. But the techniques we use, in my case, for example, to find exploding stars in the sky, it's a very similar technique that could be used, for example, to find, you know, looking at the other side, to look for, you know, are there fires somewhere on Earth that we could discover early on, or are they like uh, breast cancer? You know, Im these digital imaging techniques we have developed I can think of tons of applications. And in fact, if, I, if I'm, if I'm going to say that in, in this forum, I think that's, that's a hard part to get across to, to other funding agencies that, hey, here we are. We have very good tools that we use in this, this particular field of research, and they could be applicable in, in other fields. I, I find that that discussion is hard to make. I, the, tr the times I try to talk to people about this, which are in different fields, they think, oh, you come from a different field, you probably do not know about the practicalities of, of, of this. So I think the answer is yes, but I think it's hard to get it across. Mm. Catherine, please. So will dark matter annihilation power light bulbs? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but will some of the, so I, my answer is gonna be spin-offs. So mm. the technology that you're developing in order to do experiments, always pays off. Uh, the return is always, I don't know, 100 times, a million times for the amount of money you put in. And the beauty of it is you don't know what it's going to be. And so, but I will, I, I, will, um, I will mention one thing that has, what is the biggest societal impact of CERN, of the particle accelerator at CERN? 
So the uh, I'll, I'll tell a story that get, then then tell you the answer. So there were physicists who would go there and they would uh, put build the detectors, but then they would have to go back home. They still wanted to access the data. Now there was a computer scientist named Tim Berners-Lee who figured out a way to do this: the World Wide Web. So there you go. That was a, that changed everybody's the life of every single person. Yeah. And will this have what will happen from existing experiments? Well, we don't know. Well, I, I want to. I fully agree with what they said. At the same time, I don't think we should be shy in actually uh, both acknowledging and saying that, well, uh, our, our culture, our nature, human, human nature, is that we want to understand. And by understanding more and more of the fundamental of nature, cosmos, where your origin of life, and these things, even if it doesn't have an immediate or long-term uh, direct application uh, usefulness for us. I think that by itself is extremely valuable. I mean, that, that's to some extent what, what's life about. I mean, we want to understand everything. So the value of the knowledge and the curiosity which we kind of uh, crave this is very, very uh, important. I, find to think, I, I, I happen to think that that's also a very good reason to go to Mars, that to have a big dream for humanity to share uh, would be powerful. Um, I'm, I wasn't going to ask this question, but since we have a few minutes and everybody wants to know, and also, Krista, you already mentioned life on Mars. Is that what we're talking about now, life on Mars? I'm going to ask each of you uh, whether you believe in life uh, in elsewhere in the universe, and, and uh, of course, uh, embedded into this is, is that the kind of life that we can communicate with or measure in any meaningful manner? Let's start with Kim Stanley Robinson. Is there life on Mars? Is there life elsewhere? Um, it seems to me there's almost certainly life elsewhere, uh, and on Mars it could be. Uh, two billion years ago it was warm and wet, and, and at the time that life uh, made its appearance on Earth, it, it could have made its appearance on Mars. The really interesting questions are, is that life essentially our cousin, that the life was started on one planet and was bounced to the other on a meteorite? Uh, that could have happened, and we should be able to identify that event if, if we find life there. Or was it a completely independent start for life so that anywhere you get the raw ingredients and the right amount of uh, heat and water and uh, minerals that life will start? That would be very suggestive if we found two independent starts in one solar system. Mm -hmm. And then also we may be able to distinguish uh, fossil life, that life began on Mars but died out for lack of air and tectonic plate movement, and etc., just went extinct. All of these are questions that are on the table now and, and uh, worth investigating for getting to some of these fundamental mysteries that were uh, so beautifully described by the earlier speakers. Thank you so much, Krista. What do you think? Well, if you don't, if we haven't misunderstood totally how we understand uh, nature, then obviously there's life in other places in the universe. Somewhere also intelligent lives with civilizations are, are as ours. Obviously, you say? Yes, obviously, because um, the, the, the biggest uh, probability is actually that the universe is infinite and there must be other places. Uh, but but the, the, what you have very little knowledge about is the how often do they occur? If we find life on Mars, that will give us a big clue on how often it can occur, as kind of Kim said. So, but I suspect that it might be so unusual with the intelligent life. They're so far away that we will never find anyone we communicate with due to the, the communication can never go faster than speed of light. Sure. The, the hardest question to answer is, is there life for Mars now or not? That's kind of uh, anyone's guess. We have to go there and find out. <laughs> Catherine? I agree. Obviously, there's life out there. And I even would say, obviously, there's life within our galaxy. Um, I even would say there's intelligent life within our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Now, how far away it is, we don't know. But what I find staggering is, I, th I think it was Krister who raised the question of exoplanets. Nobody expected that the number of planets that have been discovered... I mean, it went from zero to thousands really fast. So it seems as though every single star has a planet, or most of them, has a planetary system around it. There are, there, if there's that many solar systems in our galaxy, then the odds are that something emerged and something became intelligent. 
And then you get on all these questions, well, why haven't they visited us? And then you say, well, maybe they did. They were, we weren't interesting enough, or who knows? <laughs> but yeah, I think it's there. And I would dream that, um, well, wait, do we want to talk to them? That might not be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, but it raises a lot of interesting questions. It sure does. Ariel Gouba. So let's see. So yes, yeah, so I, I think as, as both uh, everyone has said here, the statistics certainly suggest that there should be life elsewhere. Let me be, be provocative, though. I, I'm glad that, that we haven't found too much of it yet, all right? Because I think that tells people how you know, rare and precious our planet is. And I think that that should tell everyone that we should be very careful with our planet. So if the fact that it's so hard to find life and other who wants to speak with us, in fact, suggests that it's, it, although it's certainly there, it's very rare. And what we have, we should cherish because it's very mm. fragile. I think that's a wonderful point, mm. uh, Tone, to end the, the program at. Uh, it is mm. just an average galaxy, as you said before, but it is a very precious planet. Thank you so much, Christer Fuglesang, Catherine Fries, Ariel Gubar, and Kim Stanley Robinson. Cross Talks will be back next month with a new exciting topic. Until then, as always, be safe and be brave. <laughs>